I'm Dan, I'm a fourth year maths student studying at University College Oxford and right now we're in the Andrew Wiles building which is the maths building at the University of Oxford. So this is the book which I'm talking about, it's called Fermat's Lost Theorem and it's about a centuries old problem which confounded mathematicians for hundreds of years. So there was a French mathematician called Fermat who was uh, essentially playing around with Pythagoras' theorem and stumbled across a simple but deceptively deep problem which then took over 300 years and hundreds of thousands of attempts to finally solve. The two things that really drew me to the book were the simplicity of the problem and the, the whole history of it, how it had tantalised mathematicians for so many years. It's not full of formulas and equations. Fermat's Lost Theorem can be quite simply stated, it's just about whole numbers, but beneath the surface it's deceptively deep. It comes from Pythagoras. You have a triangle with a right angle in it, and Pythagoras's theorem says that the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other sides. So x, y and z have to be whole numbers. And in fact you can find infinitely many solutions to this. 3, 4 and 5 work, or 5, 12 and 13 work. And what Fermat's Lost Theorem does is it changes the number 2 up here to a number bigger than 2, which we call n. And what it supposes is that this equation, when n is bigger than 2, doesn't have any solutions. No matter how hard you look for x, y and z or n, and there's going to be an infinity of possibilities, uh, this, this equation would never, would never be true. A gentleman called Andrew Wiles managed to solve it after spending seven years of, uh, of, kind of locking himself in a room and working alone to, to prove that there would be no solutions to uh, Fermat's equation. He abstracted just from the whole numbers to much more complicated maths, two main areas called modular forms and elliptic curves in fact. He kind of played around with what the equation meant in those areas and then later on he came back down into the whole numbers and then he knew that there were no solutions. give you kind of an idea of this, this kind of theme of abstraction, you've seen a lot of maths. If we look at this equation, y squared equals x cubed minus 5, and write it like that, and then we move into the complex numbers, and then we add in a number which is the square root of minus 1, and that's called imaginary because it kind of doesn't exist in the real world, but it, do, it does um, on paper. Now we've got multiplication on this side and multiplication on this side. This makes the problem more, more feasible to solve. And in fact, we can show that this equation has, has no solutions. You feel like if you were to look hard enough, then you would find numbers which, which solved it. Uh, but it's not true, there aren't any. There's not really many formulae in it, to be honest. It's more about the mathematicians themselves and I suppose like how their lives progressed, how they were drawn to the problem, how they took maths in a new direction. But the book is also a lot about Andrew Wiles' personal struggle. He wanted to be the one to solve the problem. He spent six years solving the problem, announced that he'd proved it. The whole mathematical world was celebrating it, only a problem to be discovered in his proof. But eventually he managed to prove it against much celebration. The sense of satisfaction you get after solving a tough problem is really rewarding. You have to think of it not just as one massive problem, but as your starting point A and your finish point B and a lot of little steps on the way. So in those six, seven years, he would have made tiny steps very slowly, but eventually make it there. Mathematicians like puzzles, they like problems. They see one that, that no one else has been able to solve. They want to have a crack at it. So after reading the book in school, I became more interested in maths. I think the key thing was that the book exposed me to much wider areas of maths. Since I've been here, I've had the opportunity to study things connected to Fermat's Lost Theorem, for instance. It's got me even more interested in it. The difference between university and A-level is that at university you work much more independently and you've got to be much more resilient, the problems are harder. But because of that, the sense of satisfaction you get from solving a problem yourself is also that much greater. Mm -hmm.